Hey ladies, happy Saturday, I'm here again. Looking very pink, I feel like my whole vibe is very pink right now. A bit yummy mummy, uh, which I did not intend to do, but I'll totally take it. I'm here with my macchiato. If there's some kind of, I don't know if it, it my camera quality is that good, but I am burning incense like literally right there. So if you see any like hazy thing, I'm not being haunted. It is just the smoke from the incense. Today is probably gonna be a little bit looser. I don't feel like it's gonna be as detail heavy as the Ian Watkins case that I did. It is gonna involve murder this time and not child sex abuse, which you'll be happy to know. <laughs> well, actually, oh, actually, <laughs> there's one theme of it. Um, it's mentioned later on, but not to... Yeah, not to ruin it. No spoilers, but it's not actually a thing, you know, it doesn't, doesn't actually happen. Anyway, I'm gonna get ready, um, just do my makeup. I don't know what it's gonna be yet, so we'll find out. But yeah, just, just as a little disclaimer that this is pretty much just a getting ready with me video where I just chat shit until I'm ready. This case is really, ooh, it's very, ooh, uh, it's very, ooh, you know? Huh, the girl's crazy, like, the woman is psycho, you know me, I'm not, women shouldn't tear down other women, but she's a psycho bitch. Yeah, let's just get straight into it. <sighs> Travis Alexander is our victim today, our unfortunate victim. And I may as well, you know, tell you now. I feel like I wanted to work backwards. Yeah, do you know what? Let's work backwards. So here's what I know about the day in question, all right? This guy, Travis Alexander, he was meant to be going on a trip to, I believe, Mexico with his buddies, with, I think, like, three girlfriends, three guy friends. They were all meant to be going out together. But previously, previous to this, in the days, like, before the day in question, oh, fuck. Oh, I'm gonna put some cleansing pads on first before my moisturizer. Oh, it's okay, I've showered. It's fine. Ugh, manky, I know. Yeah, so, um, in the days leading up to this trip, this big trip away, friends of Travis's hadn't actually heard him. He hadn't been in contact with them. And they were getting a little bit, you know, sort of worried. They didn't want him to ghost them, basically, and not end up going on the trip. So they went round to his house. No one had seen or heard from him for about four days. And so they went round to his house. They let themselves in and they were not prepared for what they found. They found Travis and he was like butchered, butchered. I'm talking, I'm pretty sure it was 27 stab wounds that he had, mainly all to his back. His throat had been slit open. He had a gunshot wound to his head, I believe. I believe it was his head. But yeah, so it's a fucking overkill galore, okay? He had 27 stab wounds, his throat had been cut open, and he had a gunshot wound. I don't know in which order the gunshot wound was. I'm assuming it was like first, because I'd, I'd, I'd like to think that the person who did it, spoilers, it's Jodie Arias, um, you know, knew at that point he was fucking dead and the, the, they didn't actually need to shoot him. He was lying in the fetal position in his sort of stand-up shower in in this apartment, right? His friends were like, holy hell. Yeah, we're gonna have to call the police. There's been a murder. So they did. They're on the phone. Hey, we're all really traumatized. We've just come across our friend. He's been slaughtered like a lamb. It, it stinks, you know, he's been here for he's been here for a couple of days. Obviously, they were a lot more traumatized than that. It was very you can find the phone call, but my editing skills aren't that good, so I'm not gonna edit in the phone call. Um, yeah, but you can go find it. The person on the line was like, you say your friend's dead. They're like, yes, our friend's dead. Like, you have to come. Blah. They didn't know that he'd been shot and stabbed and throat slit and stuff like that. They just knew that he was dead at this point. So they're asking these questions, essentially trying to rule out suicide. Then they're like, no, there's blood everywhere. There's blood all down the hall. He's obviously been dragged there, dragged back to the bathroom. He's lying in the fetal position in the bathroom, like, he's been killed. So the woman on the phone is like, okay, you all need to get out of the house, you're trampling all the evidence everywhere. And so they come out. As they're coming out, the woman on the phone, the operator, 911 operator. 911, what's your emergency? Chris, is that a weed? 
yeah, so she says, do you, do you have, like, any idea who would have a motive to, to hurt Travis? And they're like, <laughs> surprisingly, because usually in murder cases, like, it's always, no, no one wanted to hurt him. He, he was so gentle, he was so nice, like, no one knew. And they were just straight away like, yeah, we know exactly who did it. Like, it's it'll be Stalker X girlfriend Jody, Jody Arias. She's a she's a psycho, and we believe it's probably her. To be honest, if there's anyone that could do something like this, it's probably her. So, yeah, she had this feud with him. So look into her. So they did. This seems like a good point to go into the main culprit of today, Jody Arias. Jody was born July 9th, 1980, in California. There is not a lot said about her childhood. She never really sustained any like traumatic things to, to my knowledge that like anyone can find on her. Um, apparently it, it, it was a fairly normal upbringing. She was one of three, she was one of three uh, siblings. Even growing up, her parents <laughs> described her as weird, described her as strange. They suspected she might have been bipolar, suffering from bipolar disorder. Um, she was very verbally, ver verbally, verbally abusive towards her mom. In middle school, which I find really weird because well, I've been when she was like, what, what's middle school? Like 13, 14? She was found by her parents to be growing um, marijuana, the devil's lettuce, in a Tupperware box on their roof. <laughs> She's like something straight out of US skins. Her parents seized this box of weed. Don't even know how it would have grown on a roof in a Tupperware dish, but there we go. They they take away this box and they start sort of like rooting through her shit basically, going into her bedroom and looking through to make sure that she's not, you know, growing, I don't know, crack cooking, I don't know. Uh, just that she doesn't have any more weed on her, basically. Like, what other shady operations are you getting up to, Jodie? Jodie wrote in her diary at this time that um, she found her parents to be totally invading her space. She didn't like that they were going through her stuff. She thought it was a violation of her rights as a middle school girl um, growing weed on her parents' roof. So yeah, you're getting the theme, well, that because I'm trying to paint the image of Jodi as someone that just never took responsibility for her actions. She's really weird, she's very odd, she's a very intense person, and she never liked to take responsibility for what she was doing. I'm just gonna skip ahead now, because I just wanna talk about the real, the real thing. I just wanted to give you an indicator of what Jodi had always been like. Her own parents were like, yeah, she's a weirdo. Jodi and Travis met at work doing this kind of I feel like it's very much like a pyramid scheme. It was called Legal Shield. Whoa. Phantom of the Opera. Yeah, I'll buff that out. Oh! This looks so much worse on there than in person, I promise. I'll buff it out, okay. So Jodie and Travis ended up meeting when they both worked for this company called Legal Shield. And like say Travis was a Mormon and apparently they're big into the pyramid schemes. I don't know if that's legit, but that's what I read. And they met when a conference was held in Las Vegas, Nevada, and they both attended. They met each other there. At first sight, they were smitten with one another and people around that were Travis's pals said this was really good. They were really happy for Travis because he'd been single for a long time. Basically deserved some loving. Jody and Travis, the night that they met, stayed in each other's room. I don't know whose room. Literally not relevant at all, Lauren. But they stayed up talking until like 4 a.m. about religion and life. The next day, Travis said that he wanted to spend the rest of his life with Jody Arias. He, he loved he loved her and, and wanted to be with her, but the only thing was, and this was a big, big but, she wasn't Mormon and he couldn't marry someone that wasn't Mormon. So even though he'd literally said, you know, I want to spend the rest of my life with this chick, they swapped numbers um, and just, you know, went back home, went, went about their lives. However, they still, they kept in touch and they were essentially starting a sort of long distance relationship type thing. Oh, one thing I didn't mention is that at the time of them meeting for the first time, Jodie was actually engaged in a relationship already with the person back home in Palm Beach, California. That's where she lived. And Travis lived in Phoenix, Arizona at the time. She came back to California 
and broke it off, this this relationship she had with this guy because she liked Travis, she wanted to form a relationship with Travis. And Travis sort of, he was determined to make it work. He he wanted to try and convert Jodie to Mormonism so that she, she they could be together, so they could get married, so that he could hit that, you know? So you know how sometimes men like love bomb women? Travis started Jesus bombing Jodie. He would send like Mormon missionaries round to the house he gave her a copy of the Book of Mormon. Just try and get her on board with Mormonism. Jody converted to Mormonism for him. So the two started this um, long distance relationship. They would meet up in different places like rendezvous. They would start traveling together. The Mormon faith really frowns upon extramarital sex. It's a big, big nay nay. However, Travis was given into worldly pleasures. Um, he was given into temptation. He was thinking with his pee pee and not Jesus. So they would start having phone sex, they would start having really steamy sex when they met up together. Jodie, being a amateur photographer, she'd always enjoyed photography. This actually is quite an important factor, so I probably should have mentioned that when I was talking about her upbringing. Jodie would take the camera sometimes into the bedroom, not to charge it overnight, but to take nudes of them both. And then obviously when they were at home, when they when they weren't together, when they were both back in their home states, they exchanged over 82,000 emails to one another. And a lot of them were like very racy, but obviously it had to be kept secret. <laughs> There's a guy passing under my window with like the biggest blunt just sparking up. I wonder if he grew that in a Tupperware dish. Basically, they very much went against the whole like non non sexual relationship because it almost became like the core of their relationship. They were very yeah, they were very active with one another. And Jody would often go and stay with Travis in his apartment in Phoenix, Arizona, and his friends like didn't really like Jody. Travis's friends just picked up a really weird vibe from Jody. She was very possessive. She didn't like Travis having any girlfriends. She would be really off with his girlfriends and even be threatening like behind closed doors she would email them like calling them shameful whores travis's friends like would note that jody literally would never leave travis alone she would never give him space if they all went out together to a pub or something and he needed the toilet he would get up to go to the toilet she would be up she would follow him she would go way outside the toilet cubicles for him to finish and then come down and sit back down at the table with them again that's really odd isn't it apparently she would also just constantly look over his shoulder if he was on myspace myspace was a massive thing at the time she would be like you know who are you talking to who are you talking to who are you talking to travis who are you talking to that isn't me hmm? yeah his friends like called an intervention was like dude this 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 chick I'm trying to imagine how they would talk Dude, this chick is like totally bumming us out. Basically, his friends were like, listen, she's she's like really possessive of you. She's She follows you everywhere, man. If you don't believe us, open the door right now. Apparently this is a real story as well, which is really creepy. But apparently, yeah, they were having this kind of like discussion in a room once saying, look, she never fucking leaves you alone. Anytime you're there, she's there. In fact, I bet she's listening into this conversation right now. Go check outside the door, see if she's there. They said it in a really whispery voice, like, go check outside the door and see if she's there. And like, your exit, where you from? So they did. And she was stood there, listening in. How weird. <laughs> oh, she's so creepy. So this opened Travis's eyes to the darker side of Jodie Arias. He would call her his kryptonite, like saying, you know, I know I'm not supposed to have premarital sex, but she just, she kind of takes it out of me. Like, I can't resist. I'm addicted to her. Which, you know, fair enough. But then she would do things like, I'll go on to discuss like some of the weirder shit that she does, even when they're not together. But essentially, she, yeah, she, massive stalker vibes, very odd. Like I said, would control his friendships with people. He would tr she would try and eliminate people out of his life so she could have him all to himself. Very emotionally manipulative. Very emotionally manipulative. So basically after this incident, after this creepy incident where she's waiting outside the fucking door for him, she goes back home to California and he basically um, says, we should break up. Please don't contact me again. 
because you're mental. Um, no, I'm kidding, he didn't say that. But he, yeah, he basically tried to keep it amicable. He tried to break up with her, but that didn't stop Jodie because she's a little bit unhinged. Yeah, she, she, she was a stalker, very much so. When they split up, uh, Travis was trying to get on with his life. She was emailing him saying, you know, I've got a, I've got a stalker. This guy says, apparently, I shouldn't be with you. I should be with him because you live in a different state and uh, apparently this stalker would treat me a lot better and I'm really scared and I need your help. There's a lot of things that Jodie talks about in this case that happen to women. But even the, you know, the judge, the jury, the, the not the execution of the sentencer, they all believe that Jodie's lying about these things and using, you know, the fact that she's a woman and that things like this do disproportionately happen to women um, against her will, which is what makes me so uncomfortable with this woman. Like, she literally just utilises, yeah, her womanly ways. It's very odd. But yeah, basically she she says to Travis, I, like, I need help, um, I've got a stalker. His friends are like, come on, you can see what she's doing. She's just trying to manipulate you into asking f for her to come and live with you. And apparently Jodie couldn't afford her house anymore, which was convenient. And so essentially she did. She, she Travis ended up offering for her to move in with him. Um, and the way, that, <laughs> the way that she would earn her keep was by dressing up in a kinky little maid's outfit that Travis bought for her and doing his cleaning. How's that for no extramarital sex? Yeah, Mormon. One weird thing I forgot to mention is that um, before she moved in with Travis, she actually had already moved into that state and didn't tell Travis. She moved 10 minutes away from his house and never told him. How weird is that? She moved there and she told her parents like, I'm moving here because I'm gonna marry Travis. <laughs> okay. And this was when they weren't together, bear in mind. And she goes to surprise him and she finds out that he's there in his house with a girl on what appears to be a date. And you know, she only knew that because she was looking through Travis's window at them both. That is so creepy. Yeah, she was just stalking him, but also like looking through his fucking windows whilst he was having dates with girls. So creepy. Uh, she also tracked down this girl. I think her name was Lisa. And she started emailing her, giving her the same jip, you know, shameful whore, leave him alone. Lisa basically noped the fuck out of the relationship with Travis after like fucking, they would be on dates and she would be waiting outside. Uh, Travis one time went on a date to Lisa's came outside to drive home and saw that his tires had been slashed. Essentially, he ends up single again and she worms her way back in and this is when they end up living together. Jodie one time even <laughs> crawled through a like, kind of like a cat flap into Travis's place. Um, and the thing is, is that most of the time when she did this, well, actually, sorry, some of the times when she did this, Travis would stand his ground and like, you know, make her get out. Get out, crazy woman. Get out of my house. But also a lot of the time he would he would give in and she would end up staying over and they would end up having sex. So Jody knew that if she was persistent um in her trespassing, that he would often um give in. So she just kept on doing it. Even though Travis was trying to move on, he was kind of Again, not trying to speak ill of the dead or whatever, but he was almost having his cake and eating it too. He wanted to move on from Jodie, but anytime she was there sexually available to him, he kind of took it, you know? Travis and Jodie at this point, they're seeing other people. Travis is seeing this girl that he met at like a Mormon single night called Mimi. And so once again, Jodie is on the radar. There is correspondence and emails that show Jodie and Travis to be having very heated arguments. It's never released what it's specifically about, but it's very heated. Travis calls Jodie a liar and says, never contact me again. And Travis also, he wrote a blog and a lot of his posts seem to be angled towards Jodie or mention Jodie a lot. Seemed like she was a big part of his life, even when, you know, he was single, not with her. I remembered I've not put highlighter on. 
Travis's last, this is really creepy. Travis's last ever blog post was on May the 18th, 2008. And it, the title of it was Why I Want to Marry a Gold Digger, uh, where he describes dating women as like having an interview. And he says, it's trying to suss out whether my, the ice cream man, bear with, we'll just wait. Pack it up, Fredericks. I actually really want a fab. I'm doing it, I'm gonna go get a fab. <sighs> I got myself an almond magnum. <laughs> All this murder is just making me so hungry. <laughs> so basically, back to the story. His last blog post is May 18th. On uh, May the 22nd, I believe. Jody's grandparents' house was burgled. Yeah, it was burgled, but only one thing was taken very suspiciously. And it was a um, 25, 22, 25 caliber gun. A gun, a gun was stolen from her grandparents' house and nothing else, suspicious. Anyway, June 2nd, why do I know that day? Why do I know that day? Anyone? Does anyone? Why do I know that day? It'll come to me. June 2nd, Jody plans to go and see her new love interest in Utah. His name is Ryan. Travis and Ryan and Jody. It's all very American. But before she goes to see Ryan, she goes to a rent-a-car, which is more than an hour away from her house, which is very suspicious. She goes to rent a car, so surely she's used to doing these long journeys to go and see Travis to now go and see Ryan, her new love interest. Wouldn't she have a car to go all this way? Who knows, but she goes to rent the car. They bring out a red car uh, for Jodie to rent, and she says, do you have anything that's less visible? Should we wait for the ambulance to pass? Dark undertones. Um, yeah, because she's like, red is like the most visible car colour. I don't want to be seen. She also covers up this car red for the whole time that she drives it as well. So this is all very premeditated suspish. Jodie was meant to turn up at Ryan's on June the 4th. She set off on this journey on June the 2nd. She was meant to arrive by June the 4th, but she didn't arrive until June the 5th. She was emailing Travis this whole time. I find it weird that she, she's emailing when she's meant to be on this road trip. But anyway, she's she leaves him a voicemail talking about how she was meant to be driving to Utah and accidentally drove 100 miles in the wrong direction. Also worth noting, whenever she returned the rental car, the mats, the floor mats had been removed. And she said that there was a Kool-Aid stain on the carpet. Sure, Jody. Travis was meant to be going on this trip to Cancun, Mexico on June the 9th, but no one had heard from him before then. I'm just circling back to the Travis situation now. Yeah, no one had heard from him. So this is when his friends go and knock on the door and find that he had been horribly murdered. There was blood all over his apartment and like I said, he was laying fetal position in their stand-up shower. Oh my God. Yeah, gunshot wound to the head, 27 stab wounds. This is looking pretty grossly overkill. His cause, sorry, his uh, time of death was said to be June the 4th. What did we think was happening on June the 4th? Oh yeah, Jodie was supposed to turn up at Ryan, her boyfriend's house and never quite made it there. She made it there on June the 5th. Travis's friends, although they knew pretty much straight away that it must have been Jody, they started like just planning a funeral for the friend who died in this tragic way. And Jody caught wind of where the funeral was and she fucking showed up. She showed up to the funeral. I would have lost my shit. That doesn't actually look too bad. Maybe I'll do one more. Also, Jodi was being really weird in trying to insert herself in the investigation. She would phone up the detectives and be like, I want to be of any assistance that I can be. And they were like, okay, no problem, someone will get in touch. But she started getting increasingly irritated when they wouldn't take her seriously. Um, and so she tried a different approach. She messaged, sorry, she rang them and said, I have some information that's of interest to you. And they were like, Okay, hold up. Jodie was like inserting herself, was saying, 
she she was given basically trying to do the police's job for them she was saying you know oh i heard that um because he was going on this trip to cancun like he was working out and trying to get fit so there's no way little old me would have been able to overpower him it's more likely that it would have been two people and they were like okay you seem pretty like dead on the point that um it must have been two people but whatever um, but none of this was going to fly, Jodie trying to convince them that she had nothing to do with it because she left a ton of DNA at the, at the scene of the crime. Handprints in the, in the blood. There was a big old whack off hair in the blood as well. And also there was a SD card from a camera that had been put through the wash. But it didn't destroy it because I don't know why. Like it's weird, it's indestructible. Just never. Once you publish something, it's there for life, you know. You can try and get rid of it. You can try and destroy the evidence, but if you ever send a text or post a status or take a photo, even on something like a camera, um, you best believe that that can be done got by the police if they do their job properly, which in this case they, they were. I'll give them credit. Hey, sorry, this is really bitty and bobby, but here my rings. But yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of losing time a bit, so I'm just gonna keep getting ready. When this SD card was recovered, they found what did I tell you? Jodie, the amateur photographer. She loves those randy photos. They found loads of nudes. Uh, they found nude photos of Travis in the shower. Yeah, that's about as much effort as I'm willing to put into that. They found naked photos of Travis in the shower um, before, so pre and postpartum. Sorry, pre and post. Oh, post, 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 M more? Totally forgot the name. Dead. Okay, he was dead. I know he's a screaming at me. Yeah, whatever. So basically, they found photos of him and he was dead. Who else did they find photos of though? Naked photos of Jodie Arias. And also, sorry, a main point that I forgot is that the timestamp on these photos was June the 4th. So they took Jodie in for questioning and <laughs> Jodie was acting really weird during the questioning. She was doing handstands in the interrogation room. When she was left alone, she was doing like handstands. She was singing to herself, just being really weird. I know that there's people that, you know, there's like Amanda Knox who apparently was doing cartwheels or whatever in the, she was just a weird person, but she wasn't guilty. But yeah, I just find it weird considering that Jodie is actually guilty of this murder that she's just fucking doing handstands. <clears throat> and she said, you know, I was bored, I was innocent. Why can't I do a handstand if I wanna do a handstand? Which, okay, fine. She ends up getting charged. The police show her these pictures of her naked and say, is this you? And she goes, I mean, it looks like me. She also says, when they confront her and say, look, we've got photos of you uh, here at, on June the 4th, so we know that you're the last person to see him alive. We've also got those photos right here that you've taken right before he's dead. And then we've got all these photos of him dead, like almost immediately after. So that puts you as the person that's killed Travis. And she goes, are you sure that that's me in the photos? She also says, can I have my purse back to put makeup on before my mugshot? Her priorities are in the right place, you know? She just has no remorse. She's like a proper, she's, I'm pretty sure she's a narcissist. I would definitely say she's a narcissist. Maybe not a sociopath, but yeah, she definitely cares about her own gain and literally has no remorse for this crime whatsoever. So after getting booked for this murder, the next day she has a brand new story for everyone. It's not that she had nothing to do with the crime this time. This time it was that she was at Travis's house. In the, on the night in question when two ninjas broke in. I shit you not, she said two people dressed as ninjas came in, killed Travis. She was terrified and she had no idea what to do. And she thought they were gonna kill her, but they apparently spared her for whatever reason. And so she hauled ass out of there and, and left. And she didn't wanna tell anyone because she didn't wanna be accused of his murder. Makes sense. Then when this story didn't fly, when no one believed about the ninjas, she then said, do you know what? Yes, I did, I did, I did kill Travis, but it was in self-defense because he abused me. So this is where it gets really, she just starts trying to character assassinate him. She brought a t-shirt in one time with a purple writing on it that said survivor in front of Travis's family, you know, after she murdered him. 
and said that I'm a survivor of domestic abuse, he, he abused me. She had recorded every time that they'd had phone sex and had gathered all these emails, which may stand to reason as premeditated murder. I think it's more that she probably just always wanted them on hand to blackmail him. It seems like she always just used to manipulate people to go, get what she wanted. She had f phone sex calls from him saying things like, I wanna tie you to a tree. No kink shame here. And it was obviously contextualized to the fact that they were being kinky. It wasn't that he said, I wanna literally tie you to a tree and leave you there. But she used this in court as evidence to suggest that she was being abused by him. Also, she said one time she walked in on him, pleasuring himself to a photo. And when she looked closer at the photo, she saw, here's the child bit, that it was a, it was a young boy, like a 12 year old boy or something. And so she started saying how she used to sleep with Travis so that he wouldn't go out and sleep with children. And that once after she was like, I don't know what you do, get christened or baptized a Mormon or whatever, she was in like this white gown, looked very childish and he made her have anal sex with him when she was dressed like this. He used to make her have anal sex whenever she didn't want it. Listen, you guys know me, you know I'm not here to make light of situations like this, but it's just convenient that this was the third story that she told and every single one places the blame somewhere else, not on her. She ended up being convicted, would you believe? The jury found her guilty, which is funny because she also said to the press beforehand, like, I'm not guilty and I tell you one thing, the jury will not find me guilty, mark my words, and they did find her guilty. The first sentence in trial was thrown out because a jury deadlocked. Then a jury deadlocked again on whether to give her a life sentence or the death sentence. One thing that I think is really weird is once she was convicted guilty of the murder, first degree murder, she went outside and told the press, I just want, I just want the death penalty. Like, I don't, I don't actually want life in prison, I want the death penalty. Weird thing to say. I don't know if this was kind of like re reverse psychology or whatever, but she ends up getting sentenced to life, she doesn't get the death penalty. After the jury deadlocks, the judge essentially decides the sentence and they give her life in prison. She's moved jail a bunch of times because she keeps getting male fans like message her and yeah, she's got a lot of like groupies and shit like that, which just kind of freaks me out, to be honest. I think people just like this whole femme fatale. Also, it's worth noting that she is a hottie. Yeah, I think a lot of people think this is a sexed up, crazed Mormon killing and she's really sexy, femme fatale. She's not really that dangerous because she's a woman at the end of the day. Well, do you want to see the pictures of Travis? This is, I'm, I'm hoping that I can edit something in here if I can be bothered, but if not, have this shot of me just going more, more somber, hang on. So basically, a, a lot of shit went down. Um, Jodie Arias, she's a crazy bitch. She doesn't like to take responsibility for anything that she does, including killing someone for literally no other reason than, I don't know, she never actually gave a proper motive. I think she just thought, if I can't have you, nobody can. We see a lot of domestic murders be this way, but I, I want to refrain from calling it a domestic case of murder because they weren't actually together. Tra Travis was trying to move on. Like, don't get me wrong, I probably wouldn't have got on with the guy, Travis. Like, from what I saw of his life, it seemed like he was very, was addicted to the idea of like a psycho bitch that's really hot, but, and you know, fair play. It doesn't mean he wants to be fucking killed by one. Like, she took his life away from him and then had the audacity to blame him for it, you know, turn it into a, like I say, a character assassination in court. His family were sat there sobbing while she was just saying all this shit about him, their dead son. So that's the case of Jodie Arias. I feel like, like I said, it's not been massively in detail this time and I have been jumping about a bit, sorry. I have been involved, like I don't need to think I just didn't care about this case or whatever, because I, I do, she's nuts. I, th I feel like in some respects this is a bit lighter than the Ian Watkins case. Yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope you've had, because by the time I edit this and send it to you, it'll already probably be past this, but I hope you've had a wonderful bank holiday weekend. I love you both very much, very much, and I would never kill you, and if I did, I would certainly never take photos of it. Bye-bye.